Hello and welcome back. In this segment, we are going to talk about affirmative action and reverse discrimination, alternative dispute resolution options, which include arbitration and mediation. We'll be discussing Executive Order 11246 and then remedies. Let's start with affirmative action and reverse discrimination. In your textbook, there's information about employment-based affirmative action plans. Those are referred to as AAPs. AAPs are examples of intentional discrimination to favor minority groups and women. There's a rationale for permissible discrimination. The AAPs literally allow for intentional discrimination which, of course, is an exception to the prohibitions against discrimination based on Title VII. The purpose behind such permissible discrimination is to avoid the likelihood of claims based on systemic discrimination, to avoid cost of defending against large discrimination claims and avoiding disproportionate high settlement expenses, and to avoid the potential loss of governmental contracts. It also allows the employer the opportunity to establish its own timetable time for re remedying disproportionate effects of discriminatory treatment. The Supreme Court has weighed in on reverse discrimination matters previously. We have already looked at the case of Griggs versus Duke Power Company. In that case, aptitude tests and high school diploma requirements were not directly related to the job. There again, we have the direct related test. Accordingly, these requirements used to determine Duke Power's transfer procedures violated Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now that case, if you may recall, involved the disparate impact theory of discrimination. Congress requires the removal of artificial, arbitrary, and unnecessary barriers to employment when the barriers operate invidiously to discriminate on the basis of racial or other impermissible classifications. And that paragraph is contained in the opinion within the Greek, uh, Greek, uh, Griggs Duke Power Company case. The Supreme Court has also weighed in on the subject in the case of McDonald versus Santa Fe Transportation Company. In that case, McDonald and a coworker, who's the plaintiff uh, and, uh, is, is, and was, is white, and an African-American coworker, Charles Jackson, worked at Santa Fe. All three were charged with stealing goods from a large shipment carried by Santa Fe. A week later, the plaintiffs were fired, but Jackson was not. The plaintiff sued under both Title VII and Section 1981, alleging unlawful discrimination on the basis of their race. The District Court and the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit ruled that discharging the white employees while retaining a similarly charged black employee did not violate either Title VII or Section 1981. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court reversed, holding that Title VII and Section 1981 applies to white persons under the same standards of racial discrimination as non-whites. The court stated that crime or other misconduct is a legitimate basis for discharge, but is not a basis for racial discrimination. Hence, Title VII and Section 1981 prohibit racial discrimination against Caucasians and members of racial minority groups upon the same standards. In your textbook, you have read, presumably already, the case of United Steelworkers of America and Kaiser Aluminum, Chemical Corporation versus Weber. Please also read the footnote involving Mr. Weber's history. 
following this case. And if you haven't already been reading footnotes within your text, please do so. There's a reason why footnotes are in your text. The author and the editors want to direct your attention to those substantive issues that highlight and further expand upon principles within the text. In the Weber case, United Steel Workers of America and Kaiser Aluminum Chemical Corporation implemented an affirmative action based training program to increase the number of companies black skilled craft workers. Half of the eligible positions in the training program were set aside solely for blacks. Weber, who was white, did not qualify for the program. He claimed to be the victim of reverse discrimination. The court held that the training program was legitimate because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did not intend to prohibit the private sector from taking effective steps to implement the goals of Title VII. Since the program sought to eliminate traditional patterns of racial segregation and hierarchy, while not at the same time prohibiting white employees from advancing in the company, the program was consistent with the intent of Title VII, according to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court set out standards for evaluating affirmative action and reverse discrimination AAPs. And those standards are still current today. And let's go through those. The affirmative action must be in connection with a so-called plan. In other words, there has to be some plan of action that is set out to accomplish an objective. The affirmative action must be justified as a remedial measure. The plan must be voluntary. And the plan must not, and these words are quoted in the opinion, unnecessarily trammel the interest of whites. Most importantly, the plan must be temporary. If it's long term and unending, it will not meet the qualifications and standards set out by the Supreme Court in the Weber case. The previous cases all dealt with private sector AAPs. Let's talk about public sector AAPs. The Supreme Court addressed that topic in the case of Weigand versus Jackson Board of Education in 1986. And that case is covered in your textbook as well. The Supreme Court struck down a layoff provision in a collective bargaining agreement that gave preferences to blacks. The Supreme Court recognized affirmative action in the public sector as permissible when, and these are criteria that need to be established, there is convincing evidence of prior discrimination by the governmental unit involved. The affirmative action is justified as the remedial measure. The means chosen to accomplish the remedial purpose is sufficiently narrowly tailored to achieve its remedial purpose. And again, there must be evidence of past discrimination. With the private and public sector AAPs, there must be a situation involving a past history. It cannot be in anticipation of something that is to come or in the future the plan must be implemented to remedy past discriminatory practices. And again, these plans must be of a temporary nature so as to allow the exception to literally exist against the prohibition of non-discrimination in the workplace. This is a very narrow, 
carved out exception for a limited purpose based on policy rationale. Let's talk about alternative dispute resolution options. So far in our textbook, we have talked about and studied cases which have been litigated. Litigation is a process by which the cases can be presented and adjudicated. So when there's a dispute, the court system is used and the court system resolves that dispute. Arbitration is an alternative dispute resolution option. Arbitration has historically been the dispute resolution process for union labor settings. Labor unions and management agree in a collective bargaining agreement, that's a contract, to utilize the arbitration process and avoid litigation. The parties, by contrast, select a neutral third person, by contrast to having a court adjudicate the resolution and having a case filed in the legal system whereby a judge is selected, the parties select a neutral third person. That third person is the arbitrator to decide the dispute between them. So by contract, the parties decide to resolve their case through a particular process outside of the judicial system. By contract, this has been allowed. And we've talked about how employment law is at its core contractual. We've also discussed how employment law involves tort law principles, agency principles, and other areas of law. But primarily, employment law is based on contract. In an at-will environment, arbitration clauses are frequently used by employers to avoid litigation of employment disputes. Now, an arbitration clause is essentially an agreement whereby the parties agree to avoid the litigation process and resolve the dispute in an arbitration forum. An individual may not have a judicial remedy if the individual is bound by an arbitration clause to arbitrate the dispute with the employer. And that's the ruling from a Supreme Court decision in 1991, which is in your textbook, with the case of Gilmer versus Interstate and Johnson Lane. That is a case which, if you haven't examined closely, please do so. It allows for the parties by contract to avoid the judicial process and engage an alternative dispute resolution mechanism, and that being arbitration. Courts have determined that if the parties are going to agree to use arbitration as the forum, certain safeguards must be established. The opportunity to conduct discovery must be adequate and it must be available. Now, what is discovery? It includes taking depositions. It includes seeking documents which may be involved in the dispute. It involves gaining information through what ordinarily would be afforded by the litigation process, but also made available within the context of arbitration. Adequate discovery must be available so that the parties have the opportunity, just as in litigation, to obtain information to plan the defenses, to determine the merits of the case, and what witness support and evidentiary support is necessary for the claims and the defenses. The arbitrator must have the authority to apply the same type of relief available from a court. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if the case is litigated through the judicial system, 
the remedies available by law in the judicial system must be also available in the arbitration process. The arbitrator must have the authority to apply the same type of remedial relief available that a court would otherwise provide. The cost of arbitration cannot be oppressive so as to preclude an employee from exercising statutory rights. Many arbitration clauses over the years have been struck down because they impose, the arbitration clauses impose that employees also pay for the arbitration process. And that arbitration process is not free. Arbitrators, which are chosen by the parties, charge fees for their services. Those fees can be hundreds of dollars per hour, depending upon the special speciality or the uh, concentration of the particular arbitrator, as well as their experience. Plus, a site or where the arbitration is held must also be paid for. It's not free. You can't go to a public courthouse and have an arbitration conducted in a public courthouse like a case would be litigated and have that made available to the public for free. The parties have to have a location or a place and most often there's going to be charges to rent that facility or pay for that environment. So the cost of arbitration cannot be so oppressive as to literally dissuade the employee from exercising their statutory rights. Many arbitration clauses today provide that the employer will underwrite the cost of the arbitration process. And that cost can be expensive, but the employer may be in a much better position to underwrite that expense than the employee. Certainly, the presumption would be that the employer has so-called deeper pockets to incur those costs and expenses than would the employee. And that makes sense. And so courts have held that where the costs are so expensive that it literally is prohibitive for the employee to engage in the arbitration process that those types of arbitration clauses uh, have, been stricken, have been stricken and are unenforceable. The claimant must also be involved in the selection of the arbitrator. In other words, even if the employer is underwriting the cost of arbitration, the employer is not solely going to be allowed to choose which arbitrator will be used in the arbitration proceeding. The employee and the employer must be involved together in the selection process in who the arbitrator will be to determine the outcome of that dispute. Please read in your text the section involving arbitration. It's very interesting. You'll also read that the decision of the arbitrator is binding and final on the parties subject to very limited judicial review and that would be according to the Federal Arbitration Act. There's a case in your textbook that the Supreme Court decided in 19, I'm sorry, in 2002 called EEOC versus Waffle House. In that case, the employee had an agreement with the employer that if there's a dispute, arbitration would be the forum in which that dispute was decided. The employee, rightly so, went to the EEOC to preserve uh, discrimination claim rights. The EEOC became involved, investigated the case, and ultimately the case was litigated by the EEOC using the information and the claims brought by the individual. Waffle House raised the point that the arbitration agreement preempted the right to litigate. 
that if the dispute existed, arbitration would be the forum in which that dispute would be resolved. The EEOC, however, was the party that initiated the litigation. The EEOC has that right once the charge is brought to its attention. The EEOC has the right to initiate litigation if it determines that there is a reason and an importance to do so. Ultimately, the Supreme Court said the EEOC is not bound by a claimant's arbitration agreement with the employer. After all, the EEOC was not a party to the contract. Please read that case. That is a very important case because even when arbitration agreements exist between the employee and the employer, once the EEOC is involved, the EEOC has a right to litigate. So that's a concern that employers may need to consider with respect to how to respond to an EEOC charge, whether or not the EEOC may later engage in litigation, and certainly those are aspects for settlement consideration as well. Let's talk about the advantages and potential disadvantages of arbitration. First, arbitration may save time and money. The litigation process can be very time consuming and costly. Depositions can be expensive. Expert witnesses can be expensive. Attorney's fees can add up and be extremely expensive over a period of time for parties to manage, not only on the plaintiff's side, but also on the employer's side. Arbitration, because it is a proceeding which does not involve litigation in the context of going to trial with a jury and the possibility for appeals to the appellate court, to the Supreme Court, and perhaps back again, depending upon the outcome of the decision to the trial courts, will save time. Arbitration is a process that can be managed in a more timely fashion than ordinarily litigation can be when considering the potentiality of appeals. Arbitration is final and binding. And that's absent if there's a review. And again, the review may be very limited, but traditionally arbitration is final and binding. Once the arbitrator decides, that decision is the decision. The parties must live with that outcome. They won't have the opportunity to appeal that decision to a higher court absent some very limited, very limited exceptions. The arbitration setting is also private, meaning it's confidential. It's between the parties. Once a lawsuit is filed, it is a matter of public record. Anyone has a right to inspect documents and uh, filings that have been made available through the litigation process. So arbitration provides an inherent privacy feature, and that certainly may be an advantage to the parties uh, with respect to their privacy interest and confidentiality. Let's look at some possible disadvantages. As already mentioned, there's no right of appeal. Is that a disadvantage? Now, one has to consider if the decision made by the arbitrator ends the dispute and it's final, one party obviously is losing, the other party gained with a victory. If the losing party believes that the arbitrator erred in arriving at the decision as a matter of law, there's no right of appeal. The arbitrator may arguably have erred or made a mistake in interpreting the law given the facts that were involved. Regardless, that outcome is final and binding. So a disadvantage to the arbitration process, although it may save time and money, is the loss of the right to appeal. 
And again, there is an appeal process, but it is, it is extremely limited and is an exception. The loss of a right to have a jury. Is that a disadvantage? In our legal system, the availability of a jury trial is unique, really, from a matter of perspectives, because not every country in the world has the availability of a jury system, particularly involving civil, civil claims. In the United States, the judicial process provides for the right for a jury, for the dispute to be heard by a so-called jury of one's peers. That loss of right may be a disadvantage to the parties involved in that dispute. There may be a reason why parties may want to have the case decided by a jury, which would be, of course, an open public forum. The disadvantage may be that loss, may be that loss of the opportunity. From a perspective, that may be an advantage as well. There's also no judicial determination. There's no judge. There will be no court of appeals. There will be no Supreme Court by which the decision can be appealed and resolved and made public by. Is that a disadvantage? Perhaps. Again, there's interest involved by the employee. There's interest involved by the employer. These are considerations with respect to the arbitration option. Potential disadvantage, which would be the opposite of the advantage earlier, is there would be no public exposure. There would be no public scrutiny. Perhaps a plaintiff would want the employer's actions to be publicly exposed. That may create an advantage to the employee in some settings or in some context, and it could also, of course, create a disadvantage. There may be good reason why both parties would want to have the dispute confidential and the public scrutiny may not be involved. Are those disadvantages? Perhaps. Are they advantages by the other side of the cone, a coin? Perhaps, perhaps too. It depends upon a matter of perspective and what the interest and the context are. Let's talk about another alternative dispute resolution mechanism, and that mechanism is called mediation. In your readings, I have included an article, which it's actually a paper presentation I made a couple of years ago, uh, it contains a lot of information, historical and background, about mediation within the employment context. It's a multi-page paper. Please read that article if you haven't already, because it will provide you a more comprehensive and deeper understanding about mediation within the framework of an employment dispute. Mediation is an alternative resolution dispute process. It again is available when the parties agree. That agreement is contractual. There must be an agreement to mediate. If one party chooses not to mediate, there will be no mediation. It's a voluntary undertaking unless the court has ordered mediation. Many courts today, both throughout state and federal uh, judicial systems, will require mediation at various points in the litigation process. Some courts require mediation at the very beginning to avoid the possibility of the litigation process uh, even getting underway. So, Absent a court order for the parties to engage in the mediation process, mediation is a voluntary undertaking. The mediator is selected to assist the parties to negotiate a resolution of the dispute. The mediator does not, however, decide the outcome. Let me repeat that. Unlike an arbitrator, the mediator does not 
decide the outcome of the dispute. The mediator helps the parties understand the pros and cons of continued litigation, whether to even engage in litigation, perhaps, and the merits, perhaps, also of the claims as well as the defenses. The mediator will assist the parties to negotiate amongst themselves a resolution of the dispute. Mediation may avoid time-consuming and lengthy arbitration and or litigation. Arbitration can avoid continued expense or even the initiation of expense that arbitration or the litigation process would ordinarily require. Please read the uh, article on arbitration. I mentioned that before. I cannot emphasize that enough here to give you a deeper understanding about how this process is involved within the uh, employment uh, framework. Mediation is a wonderful tool to perhaps resolve a dispute even before there's a necessity to have an EEOC charge or litigation. One, one point I want to make uh, known is that mediation can be undertaken at any time, at any time, even before an EEOC is EEOC charge is filed, throughout any of the stages of litigation, or even afterwards. When I say afterwards, uh, the parties may engage in the mediation process even after a jury has rendered a verdict and before an appeal is undertaken. Mediation may also be available within the framework of the appellate courts. So mediation is a tool by which the parties may use at any time, as long as they agree to mediate. Let's talk about Executive Order 11246, Affirmative Action Programs. And we've heard a lot about executive orders recently in the news. We've talked about executive orders earlier in this class. This is an executive order that relates to federal contract compliances and uh, anti-discrimination principles. The major source of affirmative action requirements is found in the Presidential Executive Order 11246. That's always going to involve the federal government the Office of Federal Contract Compliance is the organization that will oversee the affirmative action process by which Executive Order 11246 addresses. The Secretary of Labor is the organization by which these issues are brought through as well. The uh, Executive Order 11246 has various provisions. Let's look at some. Each contract that the federal government awards amounting to $50,000 or more must contain an equal employment clause that is binding on the contractor or the subcontractor for the duration of the contract. The clause contains the following commitments by the contractor. It must contain this. One, to not discriminate against any employee or job applicant because of race, color, sex, religion, or national origin. Well, we've heard those protected classifications before, haven't we? Two, to state in all employment advertisements that the applicants will be considered on the basis of their qualifications. Three, to advise all unions of the employer's commitments under the executive order compliance requirements. And four, to include the same type of equal employment opportunity agreement in every subcontract or even a purchase order. There is also supply and uh, service and supply contracts. Service and supply contracts between contractors and subcontractors having 50 or more employees and a contract exceeding $50,000 must develop written affirmative action plans for the increased utilization of women and minorities. Again, that information is contained in your textbook. 
There's evaluation guidelines. There's also sanctions for non-compliance. Make sure that you have an understanding of the potential consequences for non-compliance of or, or with Executive Order 11246 within these frameworks. When it has been determined that a contracting firm has not made adequate good faith efforts to hire minority workers or women for federal or federally assisted projects or programs, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, after notice and a hearing, is authorized to debar the firm from participating in such projects. So the loss of governmental business may be a consequence for non-compliance. There may also be fines and fees and other liabilities which could attach for the non-compliance. So this area of law dealing with the federal government and taxpayer funded programs relates to the policies prohibiting discrimination. The source of this law is through the executive, not the courts, not the legislature, but the executive. So executive orders may be a source of employment law that regulate our workplaces. And in this context, the workplace would be uh, those organizations which receive federal funds from taxpayer supplied or, or funded dollars, governmental contracts that even reach to subcontractors. So make sure that you read carefully this section within the text for a better and more comprehensive understanding. The last section that we'll be talking about in this segment is remedies. To some extent, we've already discussed remedies within the framework of the laws that we've talked about so far, the Title VII. Uh, we haven't yet covered the ADEA or the ADA or the FMLA, but let's focus on remedies and this notion of make whole relief. Remedies for violation of the anti-discrimination laws are the subject and the objective is to allow for make whole relief to exist. Compensatory damages are available in some context. That would be for disparate treatment claims. We've already covered that. Compensatory damages will include emotional distress, embarrassment, pain, humiliation, loss of value of ordinary life. In other words, how the discrimination or the wrongful conduct that is discriminatory affected one's life, affected their status within the community, affected their status within their family and their ability to earn a livelihood. Pain, suffering, humiliation, embarrassment may form the basis by which compensatory damages are the remedial relief available through these laws. Economic damages will include back pay and front pay. Front pay is the money projected going forward after a trial that the plaintiff or employee would have earned had they been employed by that organization and not allegedly wrongfully fired. Front pay will be available in some circumstances when the employee and the employer are, are not agreeable or have chosen not to have their employment relationship resumed. Uh, we've already studied the point that a potential outcome of a discrimination case can be reinstatement. In some circumstances, reinstatement will not be possible for a variety of reasons. In those settings, 
economic damages based on front pay can be considered and ordered as a remedy, as a remedy which affords make whole relief. The judge is the uh, person that will decide whether front pay will be ordered. In our jurisdiction, it is the judge that makes that determination. Remedies will also include pre-judgment interest and post-judgment interest. So if you look back on when the alleged discrimination occurred, if, for example, it involves a termination, that's when the losses incur and the law allows for interest rates to be applied when those losses have occurred as part of the make whole relief objective which these laws require as remedies. Benefit losses may be captured too. Benefit losses such as um, the interruption of a 401k plan contribution or when termination has affected contributions to a pension plan. Well, those economic losses certainly can be captured as part of the so-called make whole relief that is available as a remedy. There's a value to benefits, health insurance, medical insurance, dental insurance. All of that has an economic aspect by which courts and statutory provisions allow for remedies when there have been violations of law. Pay differential, seniority rights, those are all part of the make whole relief aspect. So for example, if an individual has been passed over in a promotion opportunity and that claim has arose and been adjudicated and the plaintiff succeeds in the argument that there was a discrimination based on the failure to promote. If that failure to promote resulted in a pay differential, that loss has to be made up. And that's part of the remedial uh, relief that is available. Seniority rights as well. If the individual lost because of a discriminatory action, a demotion, a failure to promote, or even a termination, any reinstatement of a loss of seniority rights, those seniority rights are reinstated. Again, the whole objective is make whole relief. Put the plaintiff back in the position where they would have been, but for the alleged discriminatory treatment or action. Attorney fees are available, court costs are available, Expert witness fees are available to the prevailing plaintiff in these cases. Courts encourage employees to bring forward their claims and to litigate their claims, and that encouragement is, is uh, noted uh, by the availability of attorney's fees, court costs, expert witness fees when the plaintiff, if the plaintiff, succeeds in the case. Punitive damages are also a potential remedy, but punitive damages are not designed to compensate, but to punish. Punitive damages are a form of a remedy in that it is an example of an assessment of a so-called fine or an award to discourage that type of behavior from occurring again by example. Punitive damages are not compensatory in nature. They're not part of the economic back pay or front pay aspect. Punitive damages are exemplary damages to deter that type of conduct by example from occurring again. Reinstatement, of course, is a remedy. Instatement is a remedy as well. Instatement most often involves situations where there's been a failure to hire if the plaintiff brings a claim based on failure to hire using a discrimination theory and the court finds there to be 
discrimination in the decision not to hire in the first place in statement in statement to the job is a remedy and declaratory and injunctive relief is also a remedy as well the court may order that in the future and especially in the context of consent decrees which we've studied uh, earlier in this segment uh, with the uh, text material especially injunctive relief uh, may be available declaratory relief may be available and that's where going into the future the employer is prohibited or ordered to uh, uh, do certain things or to make training for example available or to provide opportunities into the future and a good example of that would be consent decrees where plans of action are undertaken uh, either by consent or in some instances through the injunctive relief uh, as a remedy so we've concluded then in this segment a review of reverse discrimination alternative dispute resolution options the executive order 11246 and remedies all of these uh, subjects are well covered in your text readings and also in the supplemental materials thank you